Now, uh, it is an academic book, and I, but I'll try not to be too academic in the way I present it. It's based on research I did for a PhD that I did from 2014 to uh, 2017. Um, and I'm hoping it's, some, it's also going to feed into a much more general book on class that I'm writing for bookmarks, which is a much more important project in some ways than an academic book. Um, now, what I look at in the book is really about the limits to precarity, the limits to precarious work in a particular context. Uh, and therefore, it's important that I say a few things to start with so I'm not misinterpreted. The first thing I, it's very important to say... Uh, is, is certainly I'm not claiming that there are no precarious jobs. Uh, I work in academia. Uh, it would be very, very foolish, therefore, to claim that there are no precarious jobs. In fact, by the time I finished the research for this, I, had, I was lucky enough to have not just one or two, but three precarious jobs all at once. I had three temporary contracts, all of them for short-hour bits, bits of work. So I'm, I'm very familiar with um, the presence of precarious jobs in, in, in the UK. Uh, secondly, I, I'm not supporting the mantra that flexibility is good in the labour market. This is a right-wing uh, dogma, um, and I probably wouldn't be in the SWP if that was my view of how uh, jobs should function. Uh, so that's not what, I, what I'm going to argue, be arguing. Um, so what then is the point of this book? Why write about the limits of precarity? And I think there are three key reasons why I wanted to write about this. The first is that sometimes by emphasising the growth of precarious jobs, and often you get this in press releases from the TUC and people like that, we miss the wider problems faced by many working class people, which are not simply about the question of precarity. I think it's Tolstoy who says, isn't it, that uh, when you look at unhappy families, they're each unhappy in their own individual, unique way. And that's also true of working class people. There's lots of unique forms of unhappiness that we experience. They're not all to do with precarity as I'm going to, precariousness as I'm going to. So I use the word precarity. Um, precarity has, has entered the lexicon of particularly the sort of radical left in, in academia. Nobody uses the perfectly good Anglo-Saxon term precariousness. It's as if that word doesn't exist. So I'll continue using precarity, but interpret that how you will. Um, <laughs> But my argument is uh, that then that for lots of people in the UK, it's not that they're stuck in, it's not that they're being bounced between a series of short-term jobs. Lots of people are also stuck in long-term jobs of deteriorating quality. In other words, it's not just flexibility that's a problem. Stability can also be a problem. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. The second thing is, theoretically, there are often claims in particularly left-wing uh, critical academia of a very simple duality between precarious jobs and stable jobs, what Guy Standing calls the salariat, or the, uh, I forget what the other term, the pro, profin, whatever it is that he talks about, um, versus the precariat. And I think this is a crude and inaccurate way of exploring labour markets and how they actually work. I want to say more about that theoretically. Uh, drawing on Marx's political economy. And the third thing is a strategic question. Um, for most of the 20th century, a fundamental basic premise, if you were on the radical left, was that the working class were subjects of their own self-emancipation. The privileged subject of struggle was the working class. I think in a lot of radical left r literature in recent years, the working class has been transformed to this abject state, this abject position of suffering and very little else. Uh, and I want to challenge this conception, this self-conception of the working class sometimes, that we now have an unqualified, abject position. Let me, uh... It comes out in lots of ways in Guy Standing's book, book The Precariat. The Precariat, the precarious section of the, of the working class, if you like, are a new dangerous class. We have to shepherd them away from the dangers of right-wing populism and so on. They can't be a force for emancipation. They're a group to be pitied. A group that suffered. A uh, quote from the ridiculous, increasingly ridiculous Slavoj Žižek from 2012, in the wake of a 2.5 million strong public sector strike, this is a, st a strike, he says, by the um, salaried bourgeoisie. 
um, striking to defend their privilege, these are sort of dinner ladies and low paid civil service workers and so on, uh, the salaried bourgeoisie, these privileged people, and everyone else is just unemployed inhabitants of slums and ghettos and so on. Very commonplace position. Uh, this is just a, a graph I did just for fun showing how rife um, sort of discussions of precariat and precarity become in academia. This is an astonishing quote I found in, in a book by, by two people who are followers of Guy Standing, who writes in the precariat. <coughs> in the UK, almost two out of three women belong to the precariat, and only one third of men find themselves in a precarious position. Where does this data come from? And that's one of the questions I'll be asking. But it's very, very commonplace, these kind of conceptions. Now, what I think one of the things this reveals is the kind of problems that, that you encounter when you read these discussions in terms of a number of kind of sleight of hands that are performed when people talk about precarity. Uh, the first one is, is what, what the hell are we talking about when we talk about precarity? When I talk to most working class people in the real world, if I talk about precarity or precariousness in employment, they think that I'm talking about short-term jobs, people being bounced between temporary contracts or zero-hours contracts or things like that. And that seems perfectly reasonable to me. The minute you push academics on, the, on this kind of question, they start saying, well, actually, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something much more vague and often existential when I talk about precarity. So to take this to a very, a very extreme case, um, there's some academics called Nielsen and Rossiter, they wrote an article, and they say that they're looking for a co convergence between precarity at work and ontological precariousness, which they associate with the vulnerability and susceptibility to injury of the human animal. Now, that definition actually comes from Judith Butler, who wrote very famously, quite a good book, after 9-11, about the precariousness of human life, which 9-11 reveals the precariousness of human life. But if that's where you're setting the bar for precarity, then, yeah, there's going to be a lot of precarity. It's, it's pretty much inescapable, as is the human condition, sadly. Well, it's escapable, but not in a nice way. Um, secondly, even if you look at standing, who focuses on employment, the bar for precarity can be quite low. Um, for example, standing lists a whole series of groups of people, he says, are sort of precarious or, or, or precariat or whatever, and includes in this those who are dependent on others for allocating them to tasks over which they have little control. <laughs> Has anyone ever experienced that in the workplace? I, I, I'm pretty sure I've experienced someone giving me jobs over which I had little control. I think even when I worked for the SWP occasionally, <laughs> that, that would happen. Um, does that put me in the precariat? It's, it's a very, very low bar you're setting here. And thirdly, resulting from this, you get this weird aggregation of categories that don't often fit together. This is what Zizek does when he talks about the unemployed. It's what Standing does when he lumps together lots of different categories of workers. In this quote, Mellon and Blom, um, they achieve this figure by including everyone who has a part-time job. Now, I'm not saying that part-time jobs can't be precarious, but to automatically assume that they're precarious in any meaningful sense is a, is a, it's just a categorical error. Um, you have to demonstrate they're precarious. You can't just assume it. So that's some of the problems. Now, to try and solve this problem, this is a slightly academic bit, um, I decided to, to make it very clear to people. You can, you, of course, you can disagree with this definition, but I wanted to make it clear what I meant when I talked about precarity so people could decide whether what I was saying made sense or not. So first of all, I said that precarity, when I talk about precarity, I'm talking about an objective position, situation. I'm not talking about what people think about the situation. I'm talking about what the reality of people's situation is. Secondly, I want to get away from this kind of existential precarity and look at the world of work and employment. And thirdly, I wanted to look at the contingency of the employment relation. Is there something about the employment relation that has made it more fluid, more short-term, more flexible? And I distinguish this, I'm going to talk a little bit about insecurity as well. Um, insecurity I take as a subjective counterpart. It's what people think about their situation, which can often be quite dif different from the objective situation. Again, about work rather than about life generally. 
And it might be about the continuity of the job, this is sometimes called job tenure uh, insecurity, or it might be about the quality of the job, job status insecurity, to use the jargon. And I'll talk about that distinction later on. So I'll focus first of all on precarity, and then I'll come back and talk about insecurity. OK. Um, one other thing about my research. Um, it, it's very, very specific where I focus. I only look at the UK economy, and that's important. I'm not, um, I'm not saying that the situation that I'm describing is the same in Greece, or in Spain, or in Italy, or in the USA. I'm focused on Britain. Uh, I'm focused on the period really from the early 1980s through to 2015, where my data ends, so not, not too long ago. But it, it's important to say, say it goes to 2015 because it captures a lot of the post-crisis years. And that's why it, it kind of goes beyond quite a lot of the earlier research, which I, I've drawn on. Um, now, why is it relevant to talk about Britain? Um, because, what, see, one of the problems is there are massive variations in the data. But, but you wouldn't necessarily know this if you read some of the literature. Because a lot of the literature by people like Standing and people like that is directed towards economies like the UK economy. And part of the reason for this is that the UK economy has experienced since the early 1980s this very dramatic process of the imposition of neoliberal policies, of decline in manufacturing, of a shift of the service sector, of a rise of finance, and so on and so forth. And my argument is not that Britain is somehow typical. My point is that if you, if you can't see precarity developing in a large, on a large scale in the labour labor force in Britain, we should be careful about making this automatic association between neoliberal transformation on the one hand and it taking the form of a, of a massive rise in precarious working on the other. In other words, I'm not saying that precarious working hasn't gone up in some contexts, but I'm saying we can't make an automatic connection between the two. I want to, I want to question this. Now, what, this is quite, my book is quite empirical. I, I use, to use the jargon, quantitative methods. I'm not saying you should only use quantitative methods. I'm saying that's what I've used. You also need to ask people what they think and do qualitative research as well. But I use quantitative methods. How do I measure this? Well, it seems logical to me that if work is becoming more contingent, one of two things should have happened. The first and most obvious thing is there should be a, a sharp rise in things like temporary working, forms of, of temporary contract. Now, lots of people object quite reasonably that in Britain there's no point using temporary contracts because labour protections are so limited and the labour market so liberalised that you can just kick people out of their jobs anyway. So I don't just look at temporary contracts. The other thing I look at is how long in practice do jobs last? The tenure of employment. Yeah? And when I talk about tenure of employment, I'm, I'm talking about the question, how long have you been with your current employer? Not how long have you been in your current job specification. How long have you been with your current employer? That's the metric I'm using. OK, so data. This is the UK data on temporary work from 1984, I think it started, through to 2015. All of this data, unless I say otherwise, is data I've compiled from, or actually derived from sources which are in the this is the Labour Force survey, it's the sound of thing that people use. I can talk a lot more about how I got this data uh, and what I did to, 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 to generate it, but I'm not going to bore people unless you really want to be bored with that information. Now, the interesting thing about temporary employment is it's been stubbornly stable in Britain right through the neoliberal period. There's a relatively sharp increase here. This is interesting because in this period, there's an earlier wave of uh, mainstream discussion about the, the end of jobs for life. It wasn't really conducted on the rubric of precarity, but there was a real panic in the 1990s, late 1990s, if you read the literature, about the end of jobs for life, temporary work, agency work, and so on. Uh, and yet, quite quickly after, in, in the late 1990s, it begins to decline again. Incidentally, um, this is not a measure 
of what proportion of workers are on temporary contracts. This is a measure of what proportion of workers respond positively to the question, is your job temporary in some way? In other words, it's quite a broad measure of temporary working, encompassing all different kinds of work. It's a point made by Ralph Fever in uh, an old article he makes. It's not a narrow measure, it's quite a broad measure. But it stubbornly resists, it stubbornly remains around 6 7% right through the period. Is this what people expect to see in the, this data? I'm just curious. It doesn't really fit with the picture we often have of labour markets. Now, of course, it's not just, this is not just a measure of temporary contracts, but it's not just temporary contracts. Um, forms of contingent employment are manifold. It's not just temporary contracts. You can talk about zero hours contracts, you can talk about forms of agency work and so on, and there's lots of data in the book, and I can send you the data looking at those other forms of, forms of employment, some of which is captured actually in this, in this figure anyway. I'll just uh, mention briefly about, about two of the forms of work. One is zero-hours contracts themselves. Zero-hours contracts are relatively wide, wide, widely used at the moment. Um, um, it's very, very hard to get a meaningful picture of zero-hours contracts. And part of the reason for this is that in the surveys, what they say to you is, do you have a zero-hours contract? And before 2011, most workers were like, well, what's a zero-hours contract? Um, suddenly in 2011, there's this upsurge of press stories about zero hours contracts, political discussion and so on, and the figure shoots up. And it's very hard to distinguish the subjective and objective element there. But the, the most recent data shows that use of zero hours contracts is beginning to level off and decline slightly, if we can believe it. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the reasons for that in a moment. The second thing about zero hours contracts is that they're very highly concentrated. Again, I'm, I've got data on this in the book, I won't go through it here. But we have to ask the reason, why haven't they been rolled out more generally? Why not put everyone on a zero-hours contract? It's not like the working class are fighting particularly at the moment. Why isn't everyone on a zero-hours contract? If they can get away with this, maybe they can't get away with it. But why don't they even try to do that? And that's a point, that I, again, I want to return to. The second area where I think there's more of a debate is about self-employment. And the trends in self-employment are really hard to, to read. There's been an increase of about 3% of the labour force in, in self-employment since the early 2000s. So it's gone from about 12% of the labour force to about 15%. So it's not an earthquake, but it is a genuine rise. My reading of that data, and I can again discuss this in more detail, is that quite a lot of this is attributable to people remaining in work past retirement, often in part-time self-employment, uh, some of it, though, seems to be, uh, probably about half of it, is, is probably a real rise in self-employment, often quite low paid and often quite contingent. It's not necessarily the same as the gig economy, which people talk about. <coughs> it, if you look at the data, the aggregate data, it's quite hard to find out much evidence of the gig economy on a huge scale. And I can talk about the, the surveys that have taken place if, pe if people want. A lot of it is quite traditional areas of self-employment in areas like construction, which is an area in which bogus forms of self-employment have been used for a very, very long time in Britain. It, it, it's always been the key area in which bogus self-employment, false self-employment, has been used. It may be rolled out to a few more areas, but it's not a sweeping change in the data. Okay. And just finally, on, on, on things like contracts, overall in the data... 90% uh, of people in employment are in permanent, ongoing uh, employment with a single employer in, in the UK. 90% of people in the labour force. Roughly the same as, as, as in the early 1980s. If, that's if you aggregate all the different forms of temporary, zero hours works and so on together, you get about 10%. So, OK, you, you can't see much evidence of precarity in this temporary work. What about tenure? This data is great. It, one of, this graph I think, took me about some, probably something like 10, 12 weeks to just generate this one graph. Yeah. I could go through the sort of traumas of trying to make this data work in, 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 a, 
in the discussion if people so desire. I'd love to do that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so much is sweated over this data. But anyway, there's two sets of data. This one goes from 75 to 2008. This one from 92 to, to 2015. This is more reliable. This involves some forms of estimation. It was a bit more difficult to produce. This is the more reliable one, but this goes back further. Is this what people expected? Stable job tenure, the, the solid lines are the average across the workforce. Is that what we expect when we think about jobs and jobs for life and so on? It, it's extraordinarily stable, more than I expected when I started generating the data, I must say. I'll say more about the changes in, in, in a moment. Um, the overall picture on average is stability. The, this data shows elapsed tenure. So how long have you been with your current employer? At the end of your employment, your final tenure, in the steady state, you can expect it to be twice this level. That means that the average worker is in a job that you can expect to last 16 years. Okay? This is not what people expect when they think about the labour market. Uh, and it's roughly the same as in 1975 today. But the second point I want to make about this data is that job tenure rises with economic distress. Is that what we expected? <coughs> in moments of crisis, job tenure goes up. Why is that? No one wants to take a risk on another. On exactly. Another. You don't quit your job during a recession. And this data is not dominated by people being kicked out of their jobs. It's dominated by people voluntarily leaving and moving to another job. That's a whole feature of, the, of this, this data that's very striking. And so in recessions, tenure goes up because people stick with their current employer. When the recovery kicks in, new people join the labour market with much shorter tenure and it brings down the average. Again, this is an argument about why stability is not very good. I remember interviewing Roger Cox, an old engineer from the 1970s, who was saying, you know, back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, if people lost their jobs, they could go and get another job. They weren't worried about losing their jobs in the same kind of way because there was all this churn in the labour market. Stability is not always a good thing. Okay? The third thing is that there's a convergence between genders. Male tenure declines, mainly in this period. Male tenure declines because of very specific areas of the economy. Long-term manufacturing jobs with the shift from manufacturing to services in the, in the early 1980s. Uh, the end of, of, of jobs for life in the banking sector is a really big phenomenon. Mm -hmm. you, know, you remember the old days when you left school at 16 and worked for your bank, and you stayed there until you got your carriage clock at the age of 65 or whatever, and they retired you. Uh, retail is the other one that's very striking for male employment. You know, moving from small shops to massive uh, retail, uh, much more feminised workplaces, big workplaces and so on. Uh, women's tenure, by contrast, has risen. And it's converged a lot. Sorry, this is starting to get a bit more complicated data-wise, sorry. Um, why, why has it gone up? Largely because of the rising tenure of women with young children. One of the most striking shifts that take, that's taken place. Um, largely driven by changes to legislation that mean well, after you've had a kid, you can go back to your old employer. So changes that came in in 75 and in 94, there's a few other bits of legislation. But it also is reflected in <coughs> tenure for part-time women employees. Not part-time women. Yeah. Women, women who are part-time employees. Um, it's not true of men who are part-time employees, by the way, for whom job tenure is much, much lower. But if you look at women who are in part-time part employment, um, job tenure has risen through the period. And today, it's getting very, very close it's almost, almost the same now as a tenure for women in full-time employment. Part-time work for women is not short-term work. It's long-term stable work. Now, does that mean we're not worried about women being part-time jobs? Not at all. Because for women, it's often a constrained choice. It comes about because we live in an inegalitarian, sexist world in which there isn't free universal childcare. But let's not pretend it's a, it's a form of instability in the labour market. It's a form of integration of women on a long-term basis into the, into the workforce, but in the conditions of gender inequality. Okay? So that's what's happened with part-time employment. 
And that's why it's silly to just lump it together with temporary work and so on. It plays a different role. God, I'm already massively over. So, um, how long do I have left? Got ten minutes. Ten minutes. Fantastic. So much more data. Um, <laughs> I'll probably skip some of it. Um, okay. So, yeah. Let me move on to. Um, no, this is not too bad. Okay. Um, I, I want to look at explanations <coughs> because. It seems to me that the thing that we have to explain is not so much the rise in pre precarity <coughs> as why, in conditions in which, you know, there might be reasons why they might want to make us precarious, why, why is work so stable in the UK? And I want to make three very general points, which I won't have time to develop as a, lot, a, a, a great length as I might like, starting with, with, a, with quite some quite abstract stuff and, and moving to more concrete things, about why employment can be quite stable. The first point, I take this as absolutely foundational uh, within Marxist political economy, but it's often forgotten. The basic things are the th things that seem to get forgotten. Is that when we talk about exploitation of wage labour, we're talking about a situation of mutual interdependence. We're talking about a world in which workers are dependent on capitalists for a wage, but in which capitalists are, are dependent on obtaining, securing, at the right forms of labour power at the right times in the right places. And in, in fact, the whole traditional discourse of the radical left depended on this, this point, that we have power as workers, because they depend on us to do everything. And, and it actually manifests itself in quite prosaic ways a lot of the time. Uh, there's one estimate which points out that the average direct cost of making someone redundant in the UK is £10,575. The average cost of uh, making some redundant and then replacing them is 16,375. Now, there are wild variations across the labour force. And this is a very important point. It's not the same in every point in the labour force. But in a lot of areas, it's extraordinarily expensive. Not just because you have to pay redundancy payments, but if you have to then replace that person, you have to retrain them. You have a loss of tacit knowledge. And you might even piss off the people who used to work with them, by the way. You know, you might even spark some kind of resistance or disquiet inside the workforce. There are problems with this. And actually, in human resource management, that horrible discipline that is widely taught in my university, um, the radical preoccupation with the end of jobs for life is turned on its head. Let me give you a quote. There is no such thing as a job for life. So far, so familiar. And today's workers have few qualms about leaving employers for greener pastures. Concerted action is required to retain talented people, but there are limits to what any organisation can do. Here you get the flip side of our concern about precarity. You get the ruling class's concern about, about flexibility, losing people you need to hold on to. So I'm not saying that capitalists never try to render us precarious. I'm just saying that there are counter tendencies at work and they play out in different ways in different areas of the labour force. Secondly, there are long-term aspects to the reproduction of labour power. This is something that Kevin Dugan talks about a lot in his book, in which, alongside the short-term prerogatives of markets, you have this long-term aspiration for some kind of uh, rational order under capitalism, of often provided by state regulation in various forms. You know, the capitalists require some form of regulation of labour markets to create a level playing field among capitalists and to secure the long-term access to labour power. I could say more about that, but I'm going to run out of time if, 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 if I do. So maybe people want to raise that in the discussion. Um, but again, if you look at, at, at the forms of state legislation, sometimes the forms of legislation of labour markets render us more precarious. So when the coalition government uh, lengthens the period for qualification for unfair <coughs> dismissal from one year to two years, it makes us more precarious. When they introduce maternity uh, legislation, it can actually have the inverse effect. Now, often they're not doing it for the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it for a combination of response to pressure from below, but also responding to these long-term long needs of capital. <coughs> okay. The third point is that not all labour markets are, are alike. We shouldn't talk about a single labour market. We should talk about a series of different labour markets interacting with one another. 
For example, in my field in academia, there's a very specific kind of labour market which is glutted with people like me who've worked for seven or eight years in higher education for some incomprehensible reason want to become university lecturers. And so every job you go for, you find that 50 or 100 or 200 people have applied for the same job. That labour market is not going to function the same as a labour market in manufacturing or in dentistry or in you know, a, another field of employment. <clears throat> Similarly, if you look at things like zero-hours contracts, the points at which they introduce zero-hours contracts are very specific kinds of work. It's something to do with both the labour process itself um, and the nature of the kind of skills that you need and, and the access to labour power. I'll give you one example. Um, loads of zero-hours contracts are used in bar and cafe work. But in, to a very large extent, this is work undertaken um, either by migrants who use it as, as on their arrival in Britain, but on an even greater extent, it's students. Full-time students. The student labour force is massive in places like London. It's a huge section of the bar and cafe working labour force. These are people who historically probably would have worked cash in hand in a small cafe or a small um, bar or something. It's now given a, a, a semblance of formality for a zero-hours contract. That's one area in which they're used. But I'll give you another area in which they're used. Adult social care without accommodation. Why are zero-hours contracts used in adult social care? About, these are people who go from house to house caring for people. Why use it there? Because you have a commissioning model based on driving down labour costs. And because one of the features of that labour process is you travel between clients. And wouldn't it be wonderful if you didn't have to pay people whilst they're travelling? We'll only tra pay you for the hours where you're actually with a, with a client. There's something specific about this kind of work that allows them to use these exploitative, vicious forms of employment. If you look at adult uh, social care in residential contexts, um, it's not, it doesn't have the same dynamic. There are other forms of attack that are used. It doesn't take the same form. We have to be very aware of these concrete differences. OK, the chair's starting to get angsty with me, so two minutes. Two minutes. I was going to talk about insecurity. I'm not going to have much time to, to, to say much about it. I'm going to show you a hideously complicated graph that's almost impossible to read. Um, I love this graph. This, this took a long time to do as well. Um, what I've done for the first time, as they say, is I've combined every single measure I could find of generalised insecurity uh, in the British labour force. Um, I suppose the point I want to make um, what's the point I want to make about this? Let me show you the, the, the second graph. If you look at, if you just take one of the measures and divide what I call generalised and acute job tenure insecurity. So down here, this, this dash line, you have the people who say, I'm really worried about losing my job this year. I think I'm going to lose my job this year. And this is the actual redundancy rate. What you find is that the basic realism here the people who think they're probably going to lose their jobs this year probably are going to lose their jobs this year. <laughs> um, now, interestingly, the involuntary redundancy rate, now there's problems with this data, I can talk about it in the discussion, because you, you never quite know what's a voluntary and involuntary redundancy. But if we take this seriously for the, for the time being, it's trended down um, that there are fewer involuntary redundancies today. Uh, and it, but it, this acute job tenure insecurity follows this pattern. You look at general, these are people who say, I'm a little bit worried about losing my job this year. I think maybe, maybe I feel a little bit insecure about my job and my prospects. That's all over the place. It has no relationship really to this. Um, and it, 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 it spikes very sharply in the 1990s and in the post-crisis years. And this is all about, in my view, a massive intensification of work that happens in the early 1990s and a, and a deterioration in the quality of work by almost every metric. Pay, hours worked, bullying at work, and so on and so forth that happens in the post-crisis years. And often what's happening is, is this generalised job tenure insecurity speaking to fears that aren't just about job loss. They're about everything that's happening to work. They're about how your boss treats you, 
They're about what your experience of the workplace is. It's about the loss of autonomy. It's about the loss of variety in your job. And in short, it's about a shift in the frontier of control. People are familiar with this term, the frontier of control in the workplace, from the, someone in the 1920s came up with this term. The frontier of control shifts in periods of low levels of class struggle in favour of capital away from labour. And it means in periods like this, when they're attacking us, people really feel it, and it manifests as insecurity. But if you measure the insecurity about job loss against the insecurity about the loss of valued features of your job, you find the second is much, much higher. In other words, these broader insecurities have a really extraordinary resonance. So that, that's what I want to say, really, about the, the content of, of, of the book. And just to, to finish where I started, none of this means complacency about those workers who are in precarious jobs. I mean, I probably, like lots of you, I was along at the, uh, the rally to support the McDonald's workers a little while ago. I was cheering the delivery workers who actually had a very effective strike. I've been involved in um, the various cleaners' um, strikes that have taken place in, in London universities and so on. Of course we fight for, the, for, for, for those people, and we fight for them to have regularised labour conditions and all the rest of it. We also fight often in conditions where those precarious workers uh, work alongside people in less precarious positions in large workplaces, because we're still in a world, by the way, of large workplaces, in hospitals, in schools, in universities. And that means that non-precarious workers can fight alongside their precarious colleagues, and that's something we have to, you know, it's a political task to fight for that. But we should also remember there's a whole series of deeper grievances in the working class that are generating this, this wider sense of, of, of discontent inside the workplace, which is real suffering. It has real uh, impacts on mental and physical well-being of workers. And, and if the fundamental problem is a shift in the balance of control, we have to go back to the fundamental strength we have collectively as workers, and we have to shift that, that frontier of control back in the favour favor of the working class and in, in, in opposition to capital and what capital is doing to us. Thank you. Time now for questions, anything anyone would like to say, and we have a row of mics, so no one else can move. Fantastic development. So, uh, put your hands up, please, and I will call you, and you've got three minutes, please, Conrad. So, I'll tap on the table after two, and that gives you a one-minute warning. Okay, so I'll just say something fairly incoherent, if that's all right. But um, uh, when uh, Joseph was saying about what well, you expect and that, and I was just saying to a person in the two minutes, go, okay, well, if you'd asked me uh, before I read something in socialist work about that. My answer certainly would have been no. Um, having read it a few weeks back or two months, then you go, well, actually, I did know that. But I so said, it's, it's, it's something really worth remembering, because I'm a Unison rep at Bournemouth Hospital, and we sit around in these branch meetings, and you can tell how the headlines really have an effect on the way people think. Because we sat in a branch meeting, well, we, people are talking about organising precarious workers, and whilst it's a very valid topic and sometimes worthwhile discussing, I sort of think, why the hell are we discussing this when we work in a hospital and all of us sat around here have got permanent contracts and everybody coming in here has permanent contracts. So in terms of our organising model, it doesn't really make a blind bit of difference to what we actually have to do as union reps in this vicinity. So. The bit about being hacked off, I think, is probably the strongest bit, because um, the other bit, when you get called in by management, we're doing this reorganisation, we're doing this one, they always say to you, don't worry, we're not going to make anybody redundant. Well, one thing people often have a go at you about is they didn't get redundancy, because they want the hell out of there and they want the payment. <laughs> um, so, you know, finish off, I just think, it, yeah, it was a very, really sort of valid point and data to round home actually what some of the realities are as opposed to the headlines and the concentration really does need to be maybe a bit more focused at times for a lot of us on organising those that are just completely hacked off with the way work has gone particularly in the public sector where people are facing the kind of grotty conditions which were never associated with some of those jobs. Thank you. Right at the back there, stick your hand up, lovely. Um, and anybody else? Hands up, please. Yes. Hi, yes. uh, thanks for that. Um, it's a really small um, 
um, in terms of getting the definition for precarity, uh, because I definitely think it is a feeling of um, how precarious work is. Um, I work in public health, and what we've had uh, a lot of recently is an increase in retention um, sort of policies. Like there's a lot of um, what's called expression of interest um, roles, where basically people are uh, moved. If you're in a permanent job at work you get offered the opportunity to go work in a different department, but it's only open to those who are who are permanent staff. So actually what's happening is that uh, people are getting the different experience in different departments and they're retaining them through that one and developing them that one by not paying for education. Um, but then it's also, because it's only open to full-time staff, it's making people who are not in full-time contracts within the organisation want to apply for permanent contracts within the organisation. Um, also, not having a permanent contract also has effects on people wanting mortgages. Um, I've heard uh, things, uh, the payments go up by 40k if you don't have a permanent contract, even if you've been on multiple um, part-time contracts within the organisation for the past five years, it still wouldn't count to a bank. Um, so it's quite interesting to sort of um, have you say around the, the interaction between different labour markets rather than describing the labour market as a whole? Um, oh, sure. 아, 네, 그 불안정 노동이 증가하고 있어서 노동 계급이 저항할 힘이 약화되고 있다 하는 식의 주장이 상당히 좀 흔하고 흔한 흔하고 이것이 이제 노동 계급의 어떤 중요성에 대해서 이제 부정하는 방향의 주장으로 이용되고 있는데 어, 이거에 대해서 반박을 하는 것이 중요하다고 어, 생각을 합니다. I think it, it is important to um, argue against uh, those who would say that, um, that because of precarity, the working class ability to, to resist has, has weakened um, and that we should um, affirm, reaffirm the, the agency of the working class. Uh, it's an argument also commonly heard in South Korea, um, where we had a, a pretty high proportion of uh, workers on non-standard yeah. labor contracts. But um, even here, in recent years, the, the ratio of workers in non-standard contracts have, have been falling. 그리고 이 비정규직 노동자들이 그 싸울 수 없다고 하는 흔한 오해와 다르게 상당히 많은 노동자들이 조직화가 됐고 투쟁에 나서고 있습니다. 그 지난 2년간 박근혜 정부를 몰아내는 투쟁 이후에 노조의 조직률 10%가 늘었는데 그지 그 중에서 또 많은 노동자들이 비정규직 부분입니다. Uh, yes, uh, and it's also the case that, it, that in South Korea, uh, contrary to perceptions of precarity under, undermining working class power to resist, uh, there has been a surge in, um, in a movement of um, precarious workers organizing themselves in the wake of the, the mass protest that ousted Park and Hain, uh, such that there has been a 10% increase in the level of unionization. Uh, mostly among uh, workers in non-standard uh, non employment. 그리고 이번 영국 막시즌 기간에 한국에서 학교 그 비정규직 노동자들의 파업 투쟁이 있었는데 그 학교 비정규직 노동자들이 4만 명이 넘는 노동자들이 파업을 했고 학생들은 급식을 못 먹고 이제 빵이랑 우유를 싸다 해야 되는 이런 일을 벌어졌고 어 그리고 톨게이트의 노동자들이 파업을 또 해서 고속도로를 전가하는 그런 일도 벌어졌습니다. Uh, even during the, the Marxism event, there has, has been a strike by um, 40,000 school uh, meal workers, um, thanks to which students couldn't and had to skip school. Um, um, and uh, there, there are strikes by toll gate work workers. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Yes, I'm interested too in how this translates into practice. And the reason I raise this is that 
you know, the argument is that these people won't go on strike or won't take action because of their precarity, precariousness, or whatever word you want to use. And the reason I'm raising this is there's a small dispute going on in Hackney involving some 50 odd people who work for the council. They're the people who drive the buses and escort or accompany the, children, the disabled children to the schools. Mm -hmm. It's not a big dispute, but what they're on strike for is the fact they're not paid between their morning and afternoon shifts. Yeah. And the point they make is that if you live in London, housing costs are phenomenal, so very few of them actually live in Hackney, they have to live elsewhere. The cost of transport is extremely high, so between the shifts to go home involves an enormous expense for them. Now what's interesting is that they are extremely angry, pissed off is exactly the right word, and very confident. So that they chant on the picket lines, they're prepared to block a limited period, the entrance too. But you know, from the outside you said, these people won't take strike action, they're too precarious a position. Actually I think they're quite strong position, because the council still has to provide it's a statutory obligation to, to provide transport for these disabled kids. Maybe this will go, who knows what is going to happen in terms of the cuts to local councils and so forth. But it's an interesting example, I think, because it's precisely a group of workers, predominantly Asian, by the way, and West Indian women, who you would have thought would be the least able or willing to go on strike, who proved quite the opposite. Now, where the dispute is going to go, I don't know. But nevertheless, it's an important, I think, example of how, very minor, small example, of how there is a willingness to fight, even at that kind of level. So I'll just throw that in as a kind of concrete example. Well, thank you. Um, let me hand up. We'll be followed by... You will be very disciplined. Keep it up, comrades. That's about to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I, I, I'm really glad that uh, you, you've done a meeting on this, Joseph. If only I can point out to you that I did, in fact, buy it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, were, you were that person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because getting 10% discount in bookmarks really counts when you're, getting, uh, when you're buying one of those. Um, and it, it, it's really important for us to try and pin some of these ideas down and so one of the reasons I suppose that Standing is so reluctant to do so, he did invent the term the professoria but from, you know, always made me laugh a bit, this is a man who held three professors jobs one after another, uh, so he exemplified it in a way that almost no one else who goes to hear it does. Um, a couple of things, I, mean, I think it is worth bearing in mind that I think this business about job tenure probably does in fact indicate a sense of unease. You know, so that far from people feeling more secure, they're the ones who decide whether to stay in the jobs or not, which is, you know, we always think it's, it's just the employers are making decisions, it's the workers very often are making a decision, am I going to tolerate this? Is it going to be any better elsewhere? Which is, in academia, quite a key point, isn't it? Because the answer is, no, they're all arseholes. <laughs> So when we, it is rising again. If we stretch that line out a couple of years, we'd see job tenure going up. But the other, the, this other reason is, that, well, it won't be any better anywhere else, or it will, I won't be able to find a job. And I think at that point, it's worth saying, there is a management strategy to make you believe that you're in a precarious position. So a lot of it is in the head. It's not matched by these objective, the objective data. It, it's this concern in your mind. Oh, you know, it'll be catastrophic if I, I leave the job. I've done a lot of work with people on who haven't been paid all their wages, and that usually comes to it's put to the fore where they leave. In other words, if someone's got the money, they're owed. Um, and they're always astonished to see how quickly they find another job. And at the end, at that point, they think I should have done this ages ago. I do have uh, two little questions for you, though. Uh, Joseph, one is um, in the work, because I haven't finished the book, but I don't know the answer, so you may be, I may be asking you to give away the ending, but if you detected anything about age differences, obviously age, you know, you're not going to have nine years tenure if you're only 18, um, you're much more likely. To, you talked about people who are uh, older workers in part-time self-employment, but I also wondered if that was one of the explanations for low levels of male uh, tenure in part-time work, uh, you know, that they're, they're actually older workers who maybe are, in fact, you've got a couple of years left in them before they peg out, a, a condition I speak of with some authority. Um, 
And, and finally, that, I mean, I, I agree that there is in, intensification of work, but I wonder if that is also more of a perception than reality, since there appears to be no reflection of that in productivity. Okay, thank you. Um, comrade here will be followed by this comrade, who I'm afraid will be the last speaker because we are running out of time. Right, um, three quick points. I think, again, it's really important to return to the, the wider context of this debate is that it's being used to fuel a sort of miserableism yeah. about the ability of workers to fight. Also, um, it's part of another story about work, that we're all going to be chopping and changing jobs over a lifetime. And again, that reduces the ability of workers to collectively organise and fight. And I think, you know, I shouldn't put words into Joseph's mouth, I think that was one of the motivations for writing the book and trying to do a, a forensic analysis of um, and expose some of those myths. Secondly, and I'll mention this very quickly, is that it's completely ahistorical. If we look back in history, from 1880, 15-year-old girl, match girls on strike, the great dock strike, the whole period in 1910, where very precarious workers went on, on strike, inspirational examples of how incredibly exploited <coughs> and oppressed workers fought back. And finally, I think that one of Joseph's points that he made to start with is really important, and that is what is the uniqueness of people's exploitation and oppression of work, because it's only when we actually look at that, then we can start to devise strategies. For the women in Birmingham, it's hanging on to their full-time jobs at Sports Direct, it's being employed, it's migrant workers being employed by employment agencies. And if you look through back copies of Socialist Work in the industrial pages over a period of a year, as I did in the last couple of weeks, there are numerous really inspirational examples, very different examples, of workers constantly fighting back. Okay. So, thank you all very much for your contributions to this meeting, and um, you actually have 12 minutes. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. I'll resist the temptation to show you another 10 in graphs. So. Um, I'll just try and come back on the points. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, the question uh, which is asked about intensity of work and productivity. It's absolutely true that productivity in the UK has completely flatlined since the recession. It's been absolutely miserable. Um, now, it's very important that we distinguish, I think, intensity of work and productivity. Because productivity is how much output in, in, in money in pound terms you produce per worker per hour. Yeah, so how much value are you generating per worker per hour? When I talk about intensity of work, I'm talking about how hard are you working? And in a, in a sense, the thing that actually raises productivity most rapidly is automation, is new technology and so on, which ought, at least in theory, to mean you're, you're making less effort. So the very thing that's supposed to boost productivity is automation and removing living labour from the process. But in practice, that hasn't been happening because investment levels are extraordinarily low, because the rate of profit is low and so on. <coughs> so all that's left is workers being, being forced to being squeezed harder and forced to work harder as they sort of generate roughly the same amount of value and so on. Um, so it's perfectly consistent to say there's a rise in intensity of work, but no payoff in terms, or very little limited payoff in terms of productivity. Um, in terms of the intensification of work, the key periods are the early 1990s and the post-recession. It's hard to say what happened before about 1990, by the way, there's less good data. But certainly the early 1990s, there seems to be a massive intensive intensification of work. Um, and again, in the, in the post-crisis years, as I say, almost every metric, almost every measurement I've looked at for, for working conditions has deteriorated in the post-crisis years. Probably no surprise to anyone in the room to hear that. Um, but it's absolutely borne out in the survey data. Uh, secondly, the question of age difference, 
Um, yeah, one of the factors here is the ageing of the workforce, and that has all kinds of implications. The British workforce is much older than it was historically, despite the influx of, of younger migrants into the, into the workforce. I try to address that by through various mechanisms of the data, I have a cut-off age and so on and so forth, so it doesn't distort the, the data too much. Um, but in terms of, of, of what that ageing of the workforce means, um, I haven't seen much evidence that it's led to lots of short-term part-time male employment. That seems to be much more a feature in self-employment. Older people are much more likely to be in self-employment uh, than younger people anyway. And lots of people seem to put off their retirement by doing so. Anecdotally, this is what my mum's doing. She was a teacher for many, many years and now gone past the retirement age. And so he's doing little bits of work here and there for local authorities because she can't really afford to retire completely. And I think lots of people post-crisis find themselves in that kind of situation um, now, um, including perhaps a few people in this room. Um, there are other impacts to do with age which are quite interesting. I did try to look at whether people who are younger later, so more, more, more recent cohorts of young people, have a harder time on the labour market. Now, before the crisis, there's not much evidence of that. Post-crisis, in the immediate years after the crisis, there is some evidence that, that, jobs are not, that young people are not staying in jobs longer. Now, it's quite hard to read the data, partly because young people spend a lot, a lot longer in education now than they did 10 or 20 years ago on average. So that actually changes some of the data. But there's some evidence in the years immediately after the crisis it had quite a big impact on young people. Whether that persists beyond, the, we're now 10 years after the crisis broke, um, I need to go back and look at the more recent data because these things take time to filter through. So it's something that we need to look at again. Um, third point, people talked about retention policies and I think it's very important to say Often we're, we might be paranoid about losing our jobs, but they're paranoid about keeping us. And this, this isn't just, you know, the, the slightly fancier, better employers. Even McDonald's, an absolutely terrible employer, thinks that it can create a cadre of managers in its store who work for them for 10 or 20 years. They have these weird fantasies that people are going to stay and work in McDonald's. And they talk about this stuff. There's some really extraordinary quotes I have in the book. I'll just read one of, one of them. Um, this is a McDonald's spokesperson. Some people are naturally gifted at engaging customers, and we want staff members who enjoy that, as it's not necessarily something you can learn. In other words, we want to identify the people who can stand working in a crappy conditions but being relatively polite to customers for an eight hour or ten hour shift. Because not everyone can do that, it turns out. You know, there, are, there are soft skills here. I, 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 probably wouldn't be great in those jobs. Um, uh, there's, there's another quote from, from a quite a high up person at McDonald's from an interview. Um, Employee relations are also important. We are part of the eating out sector. Some of them McDonald's. We're part of retail in this country that has a relatively high turnover of employees. We provide our employees with the opportunity for study for qualifications whilst they're working. The value proposition for employees and hence loyalty we get impacts on staff turnover. The more confident and confident our employees are, the more effectively they provide services to our customers. Now, of course there's bullshit here. Of course we can't take this at face value. But I think it does reflect something real that they are worried about. How are they going to retain people? How are they going to hold on to these people who, who are at least passively capable of doing customer service? And it is something that people worry about, even in these quite low seen as low-skilled sectors, where you can replace workers relative, relatively simply. Um, the flip side of that, though, is what someone else talked about, which is what I think Dugan describes it as engendered insecurity, where they also often try to make us feel insecure. They don't necessarily do it by sacking us. They often do it through other mechanisms. For example, there's a, a very, very good study of the US looking at outsourcing that showed that the threat of outsourcing was often far more widely used than the reality of outsourcing. And it was used, for example, during negotiations with unions for union recognition. And there suddenly be, well, actually, no, we could move to China. And then they'd win the ballot to stop there being union recognition. They'd say, actually, no, we won't move to China, as it happens. And this is a pattern in, in a whole series of, of, of manufacturing plants in the US. Uh, in, in, this is in the 1990s, I, I think, the study. Um, there's an engendered insecurity as well 
that comes about through the, the, the simple imposition of market forces on people's lives. The way that they intensify work and so on creates this sense of insecurity because they're constantly restructuring us. There's lots of evidence that workplace restructuring, even though there are no job losses, increases people, people's job tenure insecurity. There's, people feel, I'm being kicked around inside the workplace, so I can be kicked out the door. And this is a real feeling that has real impacts on people's health and satisfaction and so on. Okay, so these are very, very important factors. Uh, final point, ju just to return to the point of all this. I mean, there are two points. There's one which is less important and one that's more important. The one that's less important, but it's my own personal preoccupation, is that I think that the way that we as Marxists understand labour markets is not often very sophisticated. It, it's too simplistic. There, there are theories like dual labour market, which has a dual labour market theory. It has a rigid separation between here are the bad jobs, here are the good jobs, here are the precarious jobs, here are the stable jobs. It doesn't really capture how labour markets work. It's far too simplistic. Jobs can be precarious and be well paid. Jobs can be, you know, it, jobs can be very stable, but, but, but really lousy jobs. It's, it's a much more complicated, fragmented picture. And we have to start developing a Marxist co conception of how labour markets work. That's a less important reason, but it's very important to me. Um, the, the more fundamental reason is, is precisely what Jane Hardy and Gareth Jenkins and my South Korean comrade uh, talked about, which is really about having a confidence to say actually things are pretty awful, but they're not all awful in a way that have rendered us completely abject and powerless. There is an objective strength here in the working class, and we have to do something about it. And by the way, Standing's picture of what the working class should look like, you know, everyone's in a union, everyone's in permanent employment, you know, I think Jane describes it in one of her articles as being a sort of cartoon caricature of this male, white, <coughs> trade union worker of the 1950s, which never really existed. Even in Britain, union membership peaks up something like just over 50% of the workforce. Uh, and this is, I think, in the early 1980s, if I remember the data correctly. In most countries, it's never been true. Even in most developed countries, it's never been true that most workers are in, are, are in trade unions. It's never been true that this caricature of the workforce, and you extend this to the global south, and it's just laughable. Just laughable to try and impose these kind of conceptions on India or Brazil or Burkina Faso. It's completely facile to do this. We have to have a real conception of the working class, and part of that is saying that workers in far more difficult circumstances historically have fought back. I always remember a diary entry from Beatrice Webb, the noxious Fabian uh, thinker from the early 1900s, where she talks about this East London work, and she says, you know, what can we expect from these people mad in stupidity, backwardness and poverty? What can we expect from these people? What we can expect from them is a massive dock strike and, and new unionism and a rebellion and, and, and a whole series of battles that transform the working class. Uh, precarious workers can fight. We're not all precarious. And objectively, the working class, regardless of its degree of precarity, has an objective power over capital. And we have to return to the question of how we, as a left, can mobilise that power and begin to shift the frontier of power in our favour. Thank you.